Hello, Johannesburg and the world. I'm Claire Mawisa, and this is Virgin Atlantic's Business is an Adventure in proud partnership with Investec. Last year, the Harvard Business Review formally confirmed that diversity does indeed yield quantifiable dividends in business. But what is happening out there in the real world? And more importantly, how can we as a business community get better at empowering the people within our organizations? Faith, I'm going to start with you. What are some of the business benefits of inclusion and how do these dynamics positively impact the workplace? You know, um, first of all, I want to say it's not a choice anymore. Mm -hmm. And these are such uh, unordinary times. You need an unordinary bank, an unordinary everything. And, um, you know, we're seeing that 30, when, the, um, when there's diversity in the boardroom, for instance, uh, business is up 35%. When there are females in high levels, business does so much better. Why do we have to do this? You know, I, I don't want to do this. And by the way, it's not up to you. I mean, people want to be recognized and bring their whole self to work. And Dr. Ishmael, we think diversity, we have to think youth as well. What potential do the youth of South Africa have? We, we know that they're unemployed. We know that they're struggling to even get an education. What potential is still trapped within our youth that we haven't unlocked yet? So youth are going to be your future customers. They're going to be your future employees. Uh, they're going to be the custodians of the South African economy uh, and the world economy. And currently, 6.7 million of these young people, over a third of our youth population, are completely locked out of the jobs market. And this is quite often translating to lifetime unemployment. A sobering stat is that an unemployed person costs the country 1.2 million over a lifetime. If we don't put these young people into work, that'll cost us 7.9 trillion as a country. And they have the potential to be brought into the workforce and to become contributors. And within youth, there's a massive diversity of youth who are grads, youth who are semi-skilled, those who don't have a matric. So there's this massive potential sitting in our 6.7 million, and the Youth Employment Service is here to help business unlock that and bring them into the world of work. Which department in an organization is responsible for bringing in that diversity and ensuring that it happens in the workplace? Everyone in the company is responsible for diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. Yes, leadership will take the lead. Yes, the HR function will support the endeavor, but everyone's responsible for diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And Tando, in your life and in your career, from law to fashion to advocacy, what has your personal experience been when it comes to diversity? What I noticed is people tend to think that diversity and inclusion are the same thing, and they're not. Diversity is when you're dealing with perceivable differences, so race, gender, etc. But inclusion really requires you to look at change structurally, attitudinally, behaviorally. And I think what I noticed in my career is that people would think, okay, we have this model who's got albinism and she's on the cover and tick, you know? But that is, that's diversity, that's fine, but it's symbolic. Inclusion requires you to be able to hone that voice for that person to actually participate in that sphere. So I think that you know, there's a bit of education that's required. The real debate is around inclusion and belonging because it's not enough to have representation. Um, just because you've got the right percentage of this type of person and that type of person in a team does not mean that you will have an improved team function and or organizational outcomes or better decision making. It's not enough. It is important. What is required is a culture of inclusion and belonging. Because it's only in that culture that the interaction between those differences can come together in a productive way. And we see this is a common failure. And I think you're spot on when you're on the cover, like a oh, tick. All right, we've got a woman on the team. Okay, we've got X people of color on the team. Great, now we can all get on with business. Fail, that's a fail. First step is to get the representation. But the real hard work is to have a leadership 
that builds an environment where that difference can have a voice and is not marginalized. Diversity is when you get invited to the dance. Inclusion is when someone asks you to dance. And belonging is when you dance madly because you don't care who's watching. <laughs> Faith, you've touched on it a little bit earlier, but could you give us um, an idea of what are the current trends, um, some current trends and future trends um, when it comes to the dynamics in gender and other aspects of diversity. You know, our company looks out and then looks back to the present, right? And I would say, if you really want to understand this, do Snapchat, because you can be a hippopotamus, you can be a monkey, you can be anything you want. And looking down the road, understand where it's going, because it'll give you a better perspective. Well, nobody's going to be pregnant. We're going to have our babies in, like, you know, beautiful tanks, you know? There's not going to be, like, genders like this. There's going to be, like, incredible fluidity. We're going to cross with robots. We're already doing that. If you have a knee that's, you know, robotic knee or shoulder, you've done it already. And you have already married your phone. Yeah. So I'd say, you know, don't think about yourself. Think about them. And put your arm around them. Put your arm literally and, you know, have your lawyers there. <laughs> <laughs> Just in put case. your arm around them Fantastic. and you will get what you deserve. Dr. Ishmael, what are people's or organizations' attitudes towards the youth? There's initially quite a fear of bringing young people into, into the, the workforce because if you've got labor laws that make it difficult to get a person out, uh, you know, it, it can be tricky. Also, often youth are coming from very different backgrounds, their cultural gaps, educational gaps. But this idea of turning mentors into heroes and a lot of those, those positions are, are seen to be successful if you prepare the company for young people coming in and saying, you're the hero here. You can transfer skills and learning. And after a few months, we have companies phoning into Yes, who are very fearful about taking large numbers of youth on board. And they phone back and say, wow, they've just brought this fresh thinking. Uh, they've brought, uh, they, they pick up on new things so fast. They've taught us a few things on how to modernize parts of the business. And so if you, if you set expectations, if you turn some people into heroes and give others the space to allow those ideas to come about, um, you, can, you can turn that around, that mindset of what it means to bring diversity into your organization. In our case, a lot of it is about bringing youth into your organization. Where is South Africa um, from an HR perspective when it comes to, um, are we more or less progressive when it comes to diversity in our organizations. Where is South Africa? So we are progressive and leading the world in one way, but in another way, we've got some big gaps. So clearly South Africa has got very strong, um, a very strong history in the last 20 years of trying to level the playing field given apartheid. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to race as a particular form of difference, uh, this is what we would call, you know, foreground in the country. What, and, and in many ways, South Africa is a role model on how to work uh, in organizations around race. But one of the unintended consequences of that is that other forms of difference become less visible. Mm. So, for example, where are we in creating an environment where no matter what your sexual orientation is or what your gender identity is, you feel it's easy to be yourself in workplaces in this country. And when you compare the two, you'll find from a race point of view, we're very active, very progressive, but from a sexual orientation point of view, we are trailing behind the United States. One of the tricky things about this field is that when you start identifying groups that you need to correct for based on history, you inadvertently marginalize other groups that don't necessarily have a voice. Intersectionality is, I'm gonna try and make it as um, simple as possible. I am in a body that has identities that have, or more than one identity, that has a history of marginalization, discrimination, or oppression. In other words, race, gender, albinism, and also being African. So I realized that when I, mean, I started, I said, oh, I want to represent albinism in a positive way. 
but it was such an oversimplification because when a project comes, I have to think about race representation, gender representation, how Africa is being represented and how albinism is being represented. And it becomes a difficult situation. It was one of the, the, the difficulties that I experienced because people, there's a singular identity myth. You only have to deal with albinism and everything will be fine after that. And that's not true. I know we might have incredible policies written about mm -hmm. diversity and inclusion, but what do we then do to make sure that those policies are actually enforced and that diversity actually happens? I think if we can start to create those types of rules that turn this behavior into the norm in a, in a, in a country, but we have to enforce those policies. And I think that great legislation and policy making and enforcement of that gives people who have valuable contributions a pathway to be able to make it. Because if we don't make the policies and make it easy for people to show you what they can do and deliver, uh, we lose out on vast talent uh, that would otherwise have really taken us forward as a country. It's proven that the more diverse and open you are to wider thought and acceptance and giving it voice, the more competitive you will be. So I'm gonna quote Investex vision for diversity, inclusion, and belonging. I'm Surprise. going to take it, it's a, it's a, <laughs> and I, I want to share it because I love it so much. Mm -hmm. Our vision is it's a place where it's easy to be yourself, and we underline the word easy. Mm -hmm. And I offer this as a way for leaders to think a little differently about diversity. Diversity is not about numbers and representation and having these groups. Yes, that is a component. Mm -hmm. Think about the individuals, the human beings in your environment, and consider how easy it is for them to be themselves. How much of themselves do they need to put aside in order to work in your space? No matter what they are, where they are, who they are, that's the vision. Um, yeah. so, and they can, other companies can have it too, it's fine. It's not copyright. <laughs> You're giving it away. With respect to diversity, if you approach it as an obligation and not as a place of opportunity, like just a, a wealth of untapped potential, then it's not going to work for you. But if you approach it with opportunity and a wealth of untapped potential, then you'll be able to hone the creative energies of all the individuals in that space to your benefit.